Have you ever been to one of those basketball games, either watching it on television or going to it, and your team that you're rooting for is falling further and further behind, and you're, you're watching this happen, and all of a sudden the coach calls a timeout. And he doesn't use his clipboard to run the next play. This isn't about the next play. This isn't about X's and O's. He calls the team together and he says, you're not getting back on defense. Uh, you're missing open shots. Your passes aren't crisp. You're in the game, but you're not in the game. You're out of it. You're going through the motions. You're jumping through hoops. You're not in it to win it. And I wonder if that same kind of an analysis by a basketball coach could also be true as well at times as our own Christian life is under analysis. If the God of the universe could say to, to me or to you, you're not in the game. You're, you're going through the motions. You're doing what you're supposed to do, but your heart's not in it. I can tell you're jumping through hoops. That's exactly what the God of the universe did. During the middle of the fifth century, if you want to join me in your Bibles, in our Gospel Mosaic series in the book of Malachi, some say Malachi, the Italian prophet. It's uh, page 801, if you're using the ESV, uh, English Standard Version Bible. Um, what had happened is the, uh, let me give you a, just a really, really, really quick overview of the gospel mosaic. It started here with God. Everything starts with God. Before anything was, there was God. From everlasting to everlasting, there's God. And God created a universe that was absolutely beautiful. And part of his creation, on the sixth day, he created man. After his own image, man and, and woman, uh, they were innocent, they were perfect. Um, and then they fell. The great thought in the garden, and believing the, the temptation and the falling the temptation of the wicked one, uh, they fell. As a result of that, every one of us born into the world is born into sin, alienated from our God, objects of his wrath. A holy God could not look on a sinful man, and yet God knew all this before the beginning of time and had a redemption plan in place. And he was going to work through people, and he gave hints all along the way that something was coming, and he would reveal himself uh, to, to man through uh, prophecies and through people, and, and man would believe by faith, and it was accounted to them for righteousness. He worked through Noah, and then he wanted to work through a nation. And so he called out Abraham, and he said of Abram, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to give you land, I'm going to give you seed, and I'm going to give you a blessing. And from you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And so the nation developed, and they went to the land of Israel. That was God's land for them. Through disobedience, they ended up in Egypt. They came out of Egypt, but God delivered them miraculously, brought them up to the brink of the promised land. But because of lack of faith, believing that the giants were bigger than God, they wandered in the wilderness for about 40 years before God brought them into the land. In the land, they served under the judges uh, for many years. Uh, but under the judges, people did whatever they wanted to do. And finally, they said, we need a king like every other nation. And God gave them a king, a man by the name of Saul and then David, and then Solomon. But because Solomon sins, the nation was to be divided by his successor, by his son. And you had the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, the northern kingdom fell into idolatry before the southern kingdom did, and so the northern kingdom was carried off into captivity by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom remained faithful longer but finally, they were also carried into captivity by now the world power in 586 B.C., uh, the, the, the world power of Babylon. And so the children of Israel leave the promised land, the land that God had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. And now they're in the land of Babylon as discipline from God for 70 years. And then God allows them to come back to the land. He, he, he always keeps his promises. They came back to the land. And when they came back to the land, they began to rebuild the temple. They began to rebuild the walls. And when we come to the time period of Malachi, it's about the middle of the 5th century B.C. Malachi is the last prophet or spokesperson for God. And, and Malachi gives a, 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 a pronouncement to them. But you have to understand now, they're worshiping in the temple. Um, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, sort of. But the priests, the spiritual leaders, were corrupt. People were marrying others who didn't know God. 
Uh, they were taking advantage of the disadvantaged, and you'll find that they were dishonoring God even with their resources. And so God's going to speak to them at this point. And in our gospel narrative, he's going to let us know what he expects from worshipers. So he wants, he wants our very best. And he, we point that out in, in verse number one, where it says, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. The word oracle means burden. It's this pronouncement where God is going to say, I've got some disputes with you, my people, but this is a burden, or it's going to be heavy. Uh, I can tell you that prophecies, when the, when the prophets would share the prophecy from God, a lot of times it was heavy. It was hard to share, even as I preach from the Word of God. Uh, there are times when it's hard to share because it's heavy. There are also times it's hard to hear because maybe it challenges the status quo. Um, and when it's hard to hear, it's never intended to bring about guilt. And it can never be me. It has to be the Word of God that brings a challenge to our status quo. So it, what God is saying is that this is a, a burden, um, the Word as it's delivered and as it's heard. Here's what he's saying. And he goes through this paradigm where he says uh, on this dispute, this is what I am, this is how you've challenged me, and this is what we're going to do about it. So notice in verse number two, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have, I, how have you loved us? Isn't it interesting? God says to his nation, I've loved you. What does that mean to you? When uh, maybe some of you heard it yesterday on Valentine's Day, where somebody says, I love you. Your husband, your wife, girlfriend, your date, I love you. What does it mean when God says that to you? Wow. The God of the universe loves me. But you say, saying to the nation, you say, how have you loved us? And you can almost hear in that question that children of Israel said, you say you love us, but how have you loved us? We're back in the land after we've been in captivity. We have no army to protect us. We have no political freedom. We have no religious freedom. We're just here. We have, we have not, we're, we're worshiping in a temple that's uh, the shell of the temple that it used to be. How have you loved us again? And is it possible that we can fall into the same trap by saying, Lord, you say you love us, but what's in our hands? What have you given us? And by the way, you can turn on television today, and you can find more than one channel where there'll be a, a preacher up there saying, God loves you. And if you love him, he's going to give you health. He's going to give you wealth. You're going to have everything that you could possibly need, cars, houses. And when you don't have that, you say, God, you say you love me. What's God's answer to that? He says, I love you. But how do you love us? Notice his response. Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord. Yet I have loved Jacob. But Esau have I hated. And let me stop there because that gets our attention, doesn't it? God hates Esau. God would, if we interpret that the way we normally would with love, hate then God would be violating what he's condemning. And that is we can't hate people. He says, love your enemies. The context here and the way the words are used, love is not talking about affection, it's talking about choice. And hatred is not talking about um, animosity, it's talking about rejection. So God says, I have chosen Jacob or the nation of Israel, but I've not chosen his brother Esau, who headed up, who ended up leading the Edomite people. I have chosen Jacob. I have not chosen Esau. I've loved you. I've chosen you. He goes on to say here, but Esau have I hated, and I've laid waste to his hill country. Uh, the Edomites lived uh, south and east of the Dead Sea. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says they may build, but I will tear down. They will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. What God is saying to them is he says, I want you to appreciate my greatness, and I love you. And I love you, 
and I've chosen you. Now, whenever, whenever we hear the word chosen, some people say, oh, we're not going to get into the deep weeds of predestination and election and Calvinism and Arminianism. Um, let me just take a minute to talk about this because God says, I love you, I've chosen you. There, there, there's no question that God has chosen us as believers. And no one can argue that when you look at Ephesians chapter 1, and it says, and you were chosen before the foundation of the world. So nobody can argue that from either camp. The question comes, and on what basis was a person chosen? What basis was Jacob chosen? Jacob was chosen before he came out of his mother's womb. But on, on, base, on the basis of what? That he was going to be smarter than Esau, his brother? Or he was going to be a better ruler? Or he was going to be a better father? The Scripture doesn't tell us in that context in Genesis. Why has God chosen you? And some will say, well, he's chosen us because he saw in his omniscience ahead of time that we were going to respond to the gospel message, therefore he chose us. Well, the wording there in the Old Testament and the New Testament won't allow for that interpretation. We weren't chosen because he knew ahead of time we would accept. So were we chosen then because of what we could offer the kingdom? No, we weren't chosen because of that. Uh, we had nothing to offer, the Scripture says. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Uh, we were chosen. The only hint the Bible gives us in terms of the answer of why is found in the book of Ephesians where it says, according to the good pleasure of His will. We were chosen. I mentioned here a couple of years ago when we were preaching through Ephesians chapter 1 that all are chosen, uh, all who believe are chosen. Um, and yet the Scripture talks about the free will of man and the fact that we're chosen. You say, how do you reconcile those? I can't. I used to be able to do that. Um, when I was younger, I was smarter. I had more answers. Um, I can't anymore. I've come to the conclusion that I have to wrestle with the tensions of the mystery of what I don't know. And that God chose before the foundation of the world and yet he says, whosoever will may come. I can't reconcile those in a way without distorting one of those great truths. Someday we'll understand. Um, in fact, somebody said when you walk into heaven, there'll be a sign, whosoever will may come. And you, you, you get through the gate and you turn around the other side, and it'll say, chosen before the foundation of the world. And so folks, when God told us this, that was enough, that we are chosen and loved by Him. And that shouldn't lead us con to confusion. It should lead us to worship and adoration as we say, thank you, Lord, that I've, I've known and loved by you. And yet God isn't done with the children of Israel yet in terms of this dispute. He said, first of all, I want you to understand my greatness. But secondly, he says in verse number six, God deserves our honor. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I then am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts. Uh, how, uh, then he says, says, the Lord, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? And God says, by offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? by saying the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? What God is saying is, I want you to worship me. Well, we are. We're worshiping you. But he says, do you understand my greatness? Do you understand honor? And the word honor there also is a word that means heavy, a gravity. And he says, and he uses these words in the, in, 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 of, of himself. He says, a, a, a son would honor his father, and a, master, a servant would honor his master. Well, I'm a father, and I'm a master. Where's my honor? And, and we say, well, we're honoring you. He says, how are you honoring me? By bringing your sacrifices of blind animals? You go through your flock, and you're supposed to offer me uh, the best of your lambs? And you find one that's blind, and you say, we've got to offer a sacrifice. Let's, let's get the blind one over there. Get the lame one. That one looks pretty puny. Let's get that one. 
God, that's honoring me? In, this, in the context of, these, uh, of this passage, he's, he calls himself a father, master, verse number 14, king, and then he, in verse number 6, lord of hosts, a term that's used for God throughout the Old Testament. It means lord of armies. And he said, well, children, we don't have an army. We're not allowed to have We're under Persian control. No, I'm your army. I'm the lord of hosts, this great army of angelic beings. I'm it for you. So he said, I'm your sovereign God, I'm your father, I'm your master, I'm your king, I'm your Lord of hosts, I'm your covenant-keeping God. Worship me. Give me the honor that I deserve. When I read that, um, that's heavy for me. I don't know if it is for you. But when we come to worship, all of our lives are worship. We understand that. But when we come together on a Sunday morning to worship, there are two things to me that are really important. One is of utmost importance, and that is we understand that this is about God, not us. And the God that this is about is an almighty God. In the course of time, in the course of worship, oftentimes in churches around this country, maybe around the world, we've diminished God, and somehow we've made the worship of him more about us than him. And so it's about the songs, or it's about uh, decibel level, or it's about the atmosphere. No, it's about God. It's about God. That I would encourage you today to take your view of God and like double it. And then double it again, and then double it again. You say, at what point do we have too big of a God? I'll let you know. God will let us know. He's huge, awesome, spoke a world into existence. He's not too big. And so we come in to see an almighty, awesome God. The second part of that is we have to understand who we are. We're his children. We're the ones who are loved by him. And so we come in to express our hearts and to give him our best in worship. I love this story. It's in the New Testament in the life of Jesus. A man had invited Jesus to come into uh, his home for a, like a dinner party. So Jesus is there. And this Pharisee who's hosting the party is astonished because a lady comes in to a, gr a room full of men. And she's a woman of the streets. And she comes and she, she has this bottle of ointment. And she breaks it open and spills it on Jesus' feet, um, wipes it with her hair. And Simon, the host, says, if he's a prophet, he would have known who she is or what she is, and she would have, he would have stopped it right there and booted her out. And Jesus you looked at that as a teaching moment, and he says, to, uh, for those who have been forgiven much, they love much. And they worship freely. When we come on a Sunday morning, we have to understand his greatness. But let's understand our brokenness. That even in our worship, as we worship together as a family, and we break our worship open, and the fragrance of which fills the room as we all together, as broken people, worship an awesome God. One more thing, very quickly. Um, let me pick it, pick it up here in verse number, uh, um, verse number 8. And now entreat the favor of God, that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand, that which will he show you favor? Or, he's asking the question. You're bringing this blind sheep as an offering, and then you pray and say, God, would you give us favor? God, I, I need this request answered. I need you to open this door. Oh, here's my offering. Forgive the fact that the, the lamb is blind or, or can't walk. He says, you, you want me to show you favor when you don't show me honor? Come on. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors of the temple, that you may not kindle fire on my altar in vain. Those next six words I have underlined, those are heavy. I have no pleasure in you. 
says the Lord of hosts. I will not accept an offering from your hand. Uh, from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered in my name. And a pure offering, for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its, fr and its, its fruit, that is, its food, may be despised. But you say, uh, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence, you've stolen, or is lame or sick. And this you bring as an offering. Shall I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has, has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am, I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations but it should start right here with you, my people, he's saying. In the Old Testament, we have some principles given that our worship of God must be our very best. And so our worship of God must be brought first. The first fruits of the fields, of the flocks, it must be first. And then it must be the best. Uh, the book of Numbers is so clear on this that we shouldn't bring blemished or tarnished offerings to God. It should reflect our heart. And the third thing that's also evidenced is that our, our offerings to the Lord, our worship to the Lord, should cost us something. Do you remember the story that's found in 2 Samuel where David was offering a sacrifice to God uh, because of the sins of the people. It was a huge sacrifice. And so he approached Aruna, the Jebusite, or from Jerusalem, about acquiring this piece of property. Uh, it was a threshing floor. So it was a, a flat piece of property, uh, probably circular, the threshing floor, where they thresh the grain, uh, throw it up, let the wind separate the grain into the chaff. And he said, I want to buy this as a place that will be holy, where we can sacrifice to the Lord. Aruna said, you're not going to buy it. I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to give you the oxen to sacrifice. And David basically said, far be it from me to offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. Sacrifices should cost us. Our offerings should cost us something to the Lord. Our sacrifice, our service, our worship. When I think about this, I think of uh, three T's. Our time, our treasures, and our talent. We all offer to the Lord. Our time. When I think of 24 hours a day, uh, how much time um, should be dedicated specifically to my worship of God, to my know knowing Him better through His Word? Should it involve three or four minutes before I go to bed at night reading the Bible and then uh, a word of prayer before I fall asleep? Um, should the time that I offer him be my very best time when I'm most alert? How much time am I going to give? And how does that time that I'm giving to the Lord relate to the time I'm watching videos or reading newspapers or whatever? Didn't I warn you this was going to be a little heavy? It challenges our, our, our status quo, doesn't it? Time. Treasures. By the way, on time, there's a, a, a movement, a trend around the United States that people who once worshiped four Sundays uh, a month are dropping to three. And those that are three are dropping to two. And those that are two are dropping to one. You say, well, this is a trend. This is worship, and ultimately this is about God, not our rhythms as Americans. And so God says, you ask, you're asking me for favors. How have you honored me with your time? And so somebody says, well, I do once a month. We come together and worship. Let's move on to treasure. Do we honor God with our treasure? First fruits, and we give Him our best. Or do we give Him our leftovers? How many of you guys like leftovers? You open the, open the refrigerator and you say, oh great, leftovers. 
Some of you do. In our house, leftovers aren't really desirable, unless it's my wife's lasagna. Lasagna is the only food in our house that's better the second or the third time. How about you? But, any, but if you have guests over your house, you say, come on in. You're not going to believe this leftover lasagna we have for you. They're not going to be impressed. We don't give God our leftovers. We give him our first fruits. So before we've spent all the money on vacation or tapped out all of our accounts to do this or to that, to buy this or buy that, we say, God, what do you want from my first fruits? How do I honor you first? With our talents, I think of I think of Woodside, and um, I'm so I'm so we're so blessed to be a part of this place. My wife and I, our family is. Uh, we have an incredible church body, and I think of I think of people in this church. They're so gifted by God. Some with skills in engineering, some with skills in nursing and medical and, and home care. Um, some in sales and some in problem solving. And, and we take those skills to the marketplace, which is mission, where we're indirectly having a, an impact, uh, Lord willing, on, on our co-workers and on the marketplace as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. But I wonder sometimes if we don't expend all of our creativity and all of our energy in the marketplace and we have nothing left to, to service the kingdom directly. Which side is a place as a church and, and part of the kingdom of God that desperately needs skills in medical and dental, problem solving and creativity, uh, graphic arts and all the rest of it, that how can I serve? We have uh, 27 people coming back right now from a, a medical dental trip to Thailand. Uh, they'll be arriving mid-afternoon. We pray for their safety after a long, long flight uh, from Shanghai down to Bangkok to Tokyo and here. It's interesting, on the way over, uh, they left here uh, flying north and flying over Alaska and then down and around uh, to, to Thailand. Uh, there was an emergency in flight where one of the flight attendants was having what appeared to be a heart attack. Um, of course, we have a medical dental team on the flight. A doctor, one of our doctors, was there along with his team to minister to that flight attendant. They made an emergency landing in Anchorage and got that person and handed them off. And that person is, is alive yet. Um, the last we heard, I don't know if it's a male or female. But I just think about that. I think of the providence of God. If I were on that plane and it wasn't a doctor on that plane, I could help that person only by staying away from them, but praying for them. But God had so gifted uh, one of the men in our church who happened to be on that flight when a flight attendant desperately needed a medical expert. Folks, this is, um, this is the last word that God gave in the Old Testament. And for 400 years, he was going to be silent. And we'll get into the New Testament next week. But the words of Malachi by God through Malachi to that, that day are heavy on my heart. And I can't read these words without asking the questions of myself. Do I understand how big God is? And am I honoring him? Am I honoring him with my best? Or am I giving him my leftovers? time and treasure and in talents. I pray the Lord would so work in all of our lives that we would not only ask those questions, but over the course of even the next few days before him answer those questions. That this moment can be a life-changing moment for us and that we would in our worship bring honor to our God and not give him blind sheep would give them our best. If you don't know Jesus yet, um, let me give a, a great endorsement for the King of Kings. Uh, he, he'll change your life, and he'll change your eternity. If you're not sure you'll spend eternity with God in heaven, uh, you don't know for sure, may I encourage you, 
to come at the close of the service. There'll be people right here by, by this camera up here in the front. They'd be happy and privileged to introduce you to the Lord who can change your life. Listen, we're, uh, we're out of time. Uh, would you stand with me and let's uh, dismiss in a word of prayer today. Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, this challenge. It's hard to preach. It's hard to hear. But Father, what we don't want to hear from you are those words, I'm not pleased with you. Lord, I want you to be pleased with me and my worship of you. And so, Father, do whatever rearranging you have to do in our lives. But, Father, help us not forget the heaviness of this and make whatever changes we have to that our worship would be pleasing to you. Well, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, the Lord bless you. Go be warm, okay? Be warm today.